Philippians chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from our God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of, my, prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give you glory. We ask God that you would speak to hearts today, Lord, that, that men and women would be excited about you, Father, that they would turn to you with all their heart, with all their life, Lord. If there be, are people here today that do not know you, God. Let, don't let them leave without saying, I need Jesus in my life. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, the background of the, uh, the book of Philippians is that Paul is in prison. Uh, that means that he is probably alone. He's probably been beaten. <coughs> he's probably hungry. Uh, uh, he uh, doesn't know how long he will be in prison uh, and he's possibly facing death and and for this guy to have all these problems you think you would think wow he must be lonely and yet he writes this tremendous this tremendous book there are good reasons why Paul could become lonely uh, and uh, there's also good reasons why uh, you may be lonely. Uh, we, uh, uh, they, they say that uh, loneliness is epidemic in our society. In fact, the Harvard Business School uh, did a, a study on loneliness, and they, they found out that uh, uh, there, there is a decline in friendship and an increase in loneliness. They say that uh, families eating together is down 33%. They, the readiness to make friends is down 33%. There, there are bunches of people uh, looking at each other, wanting to have a friend, wanting to be a friend, but uh, they're, all, they're all saying, you go first. Nobody, where everybody is afraid to step out and take a chance uh, of, of making a friend. Uh, the, the business school went on to say that the average person uh, now only has two good friends. Back in 1985, they had three good friends. Now, we don't know what happened to the third guy. He, I guess he got voted off the island or something. You know? uh, but uh, can you imagine billions of people in the world and you've only got two friends? They say if the trend continues that... Uh, uh, in one year, there you'll be down to only one friend. 25% of the people have nobody to confide in. And uh, the rest, uh, about 80% only confide in their families. And uh, I don't know, there are some families that I don't know whether you'd want to confide in or not. Uh, but So we see that, uh, that loneliness is in our society, it's in our culture. Um, uh, not not long ago, there was a magazine of a of a girl that uh, had been dumped by her boyfriend, and and they showed her, her a picture of her sitting inside a trash can. Uh, you know, and uh, the ideal is that uh, uh, you've been. Can you can you imagine? Anyway, uh, there 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 are hundreds if. If you've been on the internet at all, I, I, how many of you get any, any mail on, on your email that you don't really appreciate? Okay. It's called spam, you know. I, uh, I, every once in a while I get, I, I get an email that says, Lonely Women, and I, I'm thinking, <laughs> Give me a break, will you? I have a wonderful wife. Uh, Thousands of people on the internet looking for casual encounters. In other words, they're looking to break some, some commandments and, 
or either they're perverts or something like that. that and, and, but they're all lonely. They're all looking for something to satisfy. Uh, one team magazine uh, uh, suggested that uh, new college freshman girls uh, should go to uh, fraternity house uh, parties. You know, that's where you need to find a husband. Go, and go find a bunch of drunk guys. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't recommend that at all. You know, I, when, if I was to recommend you looking for a husband, find a guy with a Bible and a, and a job, okay? <laughs> There's another magazine that has uh, has given up on the human race, and and they're trying to get you to uh, have a relationship with your dog. You know, uh, these people uh, they want tax deduct deductions for their dogs. I mean, it's their baby, right? Uh, they want to. Uh, they think dogs deserve real diamonds, and. Uh, uh, some people actually are protesting to bring uh, so that dogs can be brought into the restaurant with them so that they can have their babies with them, you know? And, uh, not long ago, some billionaire left his fortune to his dog. Uh, hello? <laughs> There's loneliness even in the church. Uh, in religion, the, uh, people uh, in our society, there people think that they can solve their loneliness by getting married or by having children. And uh, uh, I've I've tried to encourage people when I counsel them that if, that if you think that your husband is going to solve all your problems or your wife is going to solve all your problems, you got it all wrong. Okay, that, that, they, they are not capable of solving all of your problems, uh, and children aren't either. And, and what about people who get married, and uh, there, are, there are people that get married and they cannot have kids, and they, they're thinking children are going to solve their problem? Uh, let, let me tell you something, sometimes children increase the problems, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, I, many years ago I was applying to be a missionary, and, and uh, they asked me how many kids I had, and I said three. And they said, "Well, you have too many kids." And and I and I said, "Well, there have been times I wanted to kill one of my kids, but, <laughs> but not right now, you know. Uh, kids aren't always the, the answer to the loneliness problem. I, I know a woman who has two sons and one grandson. She doesn't speak to either one of them." She's lonely, and yet she will not break that barrier to the fellowship with her grandson. Even in Christian, Christian magazines, they say 42% of Christian women are often or occasionally experience loneliness. 50% of Christian marriages today end in divorce. And the cause of loneliness is that people are disconnected. Uh, it's, it's in the culture, it's in the church. Uh, loneliness was a problem in the Bible, in case you haven't noticed. There, uh, how about the story of Hannah? You know, you know her. She was the uh, the woman that uh, was number two. She was one of two wives of this guy named Elkanah, and and she couldn't have kids. And because she couldn't have kids. Uh, her, her rival was constantly, uh, it says in verse, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6, her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Can you imagine? Here's, uh, here's Hannah crying and, and, and uh, miserable and, and lonely because she cannot have children. We also have the story of Naomi. You know her. That's the mother-in-law of Ruth. And she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Myra. Myra means bitter. Call me bitter. Why? Because her husband had died, her two sons had died. She had nothing left. She was bitter and empty. She says, God is against me. God has afflicted me. 
don't tell me that she wasn't experienced long in their life. And then there's Elijah. You know him. He's the he's the guy that uh, that made it rain uh, after three years. And, but it, the next day, the queen was after him. And so what did he say? He said, "Well, my interpretation is he prayed, Lord, kill me. Lord, kill me." I, that's pretty lonely when you think that, that you're all by yourself. Then, then, then we have Jacob's problem. He was, he was fighting with an angel. Uh, Jacob, what he did is he heard his brother was coming with an army and uh, uh, 300 men. And, and he w just had his wife and his kids and his flocks. And, and he knew why his brother was coming. He knew his brother was coming to kill him. And so he sent everybody else, you know, he sent him in droves. First, first uh, uh, his first wife, and then his second wife, and then he stayed back. And he figured that maybe his brother would kill uh, the, all of his kids on the, the first drove, or maybe even the second. But if he stayed up back over here on this side of the, uh, uh, of the, the brook, maybe he could get away. You know, I, the man was willing to sacrifice everything just so he could get uh, get away, you know, but he was lonely and uh, he wrestled with a man until the breaking of the day, the Bible says. Then there's, there's Joseph, that was his problem, wasn't it? I mean, can you imagine how, how terrible it was for, uh, it says it says in Genesis 37, 23 uh, that, that they took Joseph and cast him in a pit and uh, and and uh, it also says in, in that chapter that, that they, they talked about killing him, you know, and finally the oldest brother talked him out of killing him. I, uh, how would you like to be sitting in a pit listening to your brother decide, am I, am I going to die or am I not going to die? Are they going to kill me? And talk about rejection. He was stripped of his outer garment, you know. He's sitting there. Uh, uh, he was sold by his brothers into slavery. Imagine the rejection that he had. Imagine the loneliness as he walks away from his family in chains and taken to a foreign land. Paul, Paul had the same problem. Like I said, he was sitting in prison, jail all by, by himself. And he's writing the Philippians. He misses them. He enjoyed their company, but now he may never see them again. And it could be, he didn't know exactly what kind of death he was facing, but it could have been horrible death. But look what Paul says. It's important we see what Paul says in this situation, this, this opportunity to be lonely. He says in verse uh, 3, I thank my God for upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now you have to understand that God uh, that God is a by definition a Trinitarian. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, in, in this Trinity there, there, there is no lack. God does not have any lack. There's love and community. There's respect. There's, there's relationship. Uh, some people have said that God uh, was, was lonely when He created men, but that's not true. God was sufficient in Himself. And what He, he was sufficient in, in relationship and of His own essence and, and nature. Uh, but it does say God created man in His own image, which tells us that, that we too were created for love, for community, for respect, and for relationship. And, and God wants you to, to have a relationship, a community, or as Paul put it, fellowship in the good news of Jesus Christ. And God says in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. And, and, uh, and, and, and they did. And, and, and because God enjoyed fellowship and friendship so much, He wanted man to enjoy it too. Uh, but what happens after God creates Adam? He says something that after He created everything else, He said it was good. But when He created Adam, what did He say? It is not good 
that man lives alone, should be alone. I will make and help me for him. There, so God had the, the first man and the first woman, and, and there was God, and they fellowship together. The man, the woman, and God, they fellowship together. They, they, there was nothing he had, no, there, there was no, no worries, no, uh, but it, there was love and companionship and fellowship and, and that was God's plan. But what happens is, when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They, they, the, the first thing they did was hide. Do you, know, you understand when you have sin, what do you do? You hide. That's why things are, uh, man loves darkness rather than light because he likes to hide his sin. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They, they hid from God and, and, and uh, uh, they, they began uh, this, this battle uh, uh, to fight against loneliness. It's, it's called, we don't trust anybody. Both in culture and in church. They, they, they say you need a friend, but a shallow friendship is not the answer. Many times friendships come... Uh, well, usually we find our friends two ways. The first way we call proximity. Everybody say proximity. proximity. What that means is that you become friends with somebody because you're close to them. Uh, you, you work with them, you go to school with them, you, uh, you, 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 your neighbors with them, and because you're close to them, you become friends with them. Uh, or you frequently go to the same places. You're close to them. That's called proximity. Um, and, and you say, well, we are friends. I, I remember my daughter coming home telling me that uh, her, she had friends that were friends for a lifetime, uh, you know. And she, and she said that they're, 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 they'll be my friends long after you're you're dead and gone. They'll be my friends. Well, uh, five years later, she didn't even remember who the friends were, you know. <laughs> Why? Because they were proximity friends. They, they were they were close uh, together. Or, or, and and maybe maybe there's there's another reason why you become friends, and that's called. Affinity. Say affinity. Affinity. Uh, affinity simply means that you you have something in common. You know, you, you like to play basketball, or you go you're in the same classes, or the same clubs. Uh, you enjoy the same hobbies, or that you enjoy the same sports teams, and uh, you know, or maybe you, uh, you both have trench coats, no jobs, and your mother tucks you in bed. You know. Uh, <laughs> But that's, that's called affinity. You, you, you enjoy the same things. Uh, but these things change. Hopefully you, you stop being inducted into bed by your mother. Uh, uh, we no longer live close to our friends. We no longer go to school with our friends. We, know we have different lifestyles in, in the 2013 than we did in 1990. Uh, we, we, or you get married, and so you don't associate with other guys that stay up late and browse all night, you know. Uh, proximity and affinity changes, and you, we lose our friends. What's the answer to loneliness? Uh, Paul's answer today is found in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 1. For your fellowship... And the gospel from the first day until now. Paul calls it fellowship. Uh, the, the, the idea of friend is a little bit it, it's stronger. It means uh, it means you covenant with somebody. And and so this, Paul instead of saying friend, he's saying fellowship. It, it's like becoming a partner. It's like having a relationship. You have a relationship with one another because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, you become partners together serving Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we have a song that uh, I, I think some of us have forgotten, but it, but it goes like this. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. And, and, and that's, 
that's where Christians should find their, their joy and, and find their, their, their fellowship. And, and the song goes on to say, What a blessedness! What a peace is mine! Leaning on the everlasting arms. Uh, I can tell you right now that, that you need Jesus and, and your friend needs Jesus. And if you both will seek Jesus, you will come together and He will be there. I, 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 many times I, I've quoted uh, my, my version of what St. Augustine says. Uh, he, he says, God has made us. St. Augustine said this after all... Uh, all of his confessions, you know, he finally got around to, to realizing what the problem was. He said, God has made us. And we are lonely without Him. And if, if you don't have Jesus Christ, if, if, you're not, if you're not serving Jesus Christ, if you're not in the fellowship of serving Jesus Christ, you're going to be lonely. I, Pascal, a French scientist, uh, discovered the same thing, only he put it a little bit different. He said, he said, there's a vacuum in every one of us that only Jesus Christ can fill. Do you understand that vacuum in you is, is going to... It needs something. It wants something. It, how many of you know a vacuum? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm sure most of you have used a vacuum cleaner, except some of you guys. I'm sure most of you have used a vacuum cleaner. What happens? That, that vacuum draws stuff in. And, and if, you're not, if you're not careful, it'll draw in the wrong thing. You know what I mean? Uh, tr try, try vacuuming the, the, the throw rug. And, uh, whoop, you know, the rug will... What happens in our lives when we don't let Jesus Christ be Lord? We, we, we draw in drugs. Or, or all kinds of, of things that will not fill, but that we, we try to make it fill the vacuum that's in our life. The answer to loneliness is fellowship in the good news of Jesus Christ. Put Jesus Christ in the center of your relationship. Jesus is, is to be between you. I, I, I always try to encourage when I counsel people before they get married, I say, you have to realize that they're... they're a marriage is not made of two people. It's made of three. It's made of three persons. And, and the third one has to be Jesus. The third one has to be Jesus. Uh, the, the problem is, is, is that we, we only call on Jesus when it gets down to the, you know. Well, how many of you know that sin separates people? And when people sin, sin kills. Did you know sin kills? And, and, and so if you don't seek, if you're married and you're in a relationship uh, and you don't seek Jesus Christ, you'll either kill your marriage or you'll kill each other. You know, uh, sin kills. And you have, to, you have to understand that you need Jesus Christ in the center of your life. Jesus died to forgive and take away sins. Now we, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we... We can be reconciled to God. Do you understand? We have sin in our life. We could not approach a holy God, but God made it possible through Jesus Christ that we could repent of our sins and He would forgive us and the relationship would be healed. And that's the whole plan for God in your life. It, 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 especially in your marriage. If, if you... In marriages, we say things that we shouldn't say, you know, uh, or we say, or we don't say things that we should say. How many times a day do you tell your husband or your wife, "I love you"? How many? You know, it should, shouldn't be like the one guy says, "I, I told you I loved him on the first day we got married, and if it changes, I'll let you know." <laughs> A wife likes to know she's loved. A husband likes to know he's loved. Do you understand that? When you get married and you take vows, you probably will hold hands and you'll take and you'll say your vows. And the vows are good, and the, and the marriage uh, ceremony is good. 
uh, there's only two problems in, that, that I see. One is the, the husband and, and the other is the wife. Uh, the, the, the problem is, what, what, I know you're asking me what's wrong with a man and a woman. They, 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 will, they will make mistakes. The husband will make mistakes. We call them sin, that sin, okay? And the wife will make mistakes. She'll sin. And, and you have a choice. You can either, you can, like I said, sin will either kill marriage or, or, or you'll kill each other. Or you can, you can do what God did and you can, you can repent. You can repent of your sins like, like, like the Bible says, you see, without repentance there is no forgiveness. And, and so you have to come to your wife or your husband and say, I'm sorry. And, and, and what, what, does the, what does the wife say? You sure are. No, 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 please, please, please no. Uh, the, the, the husband and wife have to be committed to reconciliation. In other words, they have to be committed to, if he repents, I'll forgive. If she repents, I'll forgive. Because that's what God does for us. It's called reconciliation. We forgive one another. And it's the same thing in, in friendships. If, if your friend makes a mistake, you can say, well, I'm never going to talk to him again. Or you, you can go to him and, and be honest. You know, just tell the truth. I, why? You know, there's this, this idea of, 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 of Christians. We, we Christians, we learn to fake it. Somebody says, how you doing? Oh, wonderful. I'm doing so wonderful. That's called lying, okay? <laughs> Tell the truth. How you doing? I've got a headache. How you doing? I've got a rash. No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the truth. <coughs> Paul, Paul has a number of things that, that he says about these gospel relationships. I mean, let, let's face it, he had nothing in common with the, the people in, in Philippi. He had nothing in common with them. Uh, he, 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 he's not close to them. He has no wife. Paul has no kids. He has no home. He has no church. How could he be friends with them? Uh, he, I mean, they're, they're married and he's single. They have children. He didn't have any. They're, they're on the job and he's in jail. Uh, nothing in common. And yet, and yet because of Jesus Christ, he has fellowship with them. Because of Jesus Christ. He, he, he writes. He writes the letter, a letter to them, and like like you would to a friend. And, and he, and the first, one of the first things he says to them is grace to you. Now, the way it's written in in, in, in the King James Bible, I'm not sure whether he's saying the grace of God to you or I give grace to you. But I I, I like to think it's both. You see, because when when Paul was in, in Philippi, you know what they did to him? They beat him and then threw him in jail. Okay? And, and Paul, Paul could have said, I, I remember what they did in Philippi, and I'm not going to forgive them, you know. What, what is grace? What is grace? We have this definition. Grace is unmerited favor, right? What does that mean? Okay, I, I, like, to, I like my definition better. Uh, my definition for grace is grace is you don't uh, excuse me, that you you get what you don't deserve. Grace is you get what you don't deserve. If somebody does something to you, if somebody hurts you, what should you do? You can either judge them and you know, well, I'm doing unto you like what you did to me, you know. That's not what the Bible says. This is grace. Don't give them what they deserve. Give them what they don't deserve. Give them grace. What? 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 Now, the other side of the coin, there's mercy and grace. They, they come together. Mercy, what is mercy? Mercy means, well, my definition simply is mercy is you get what you don't deserve. 
In other words, if you if you if you if you if you kill somebody, you deserve to die yourself. But when you have mercy on somebody, you say, oh, have mercy, don't, don't kill me, please have mercy on me. Well, if he, the person is not killed, he, he gets what he doesn't deserve, he gets life. And that's mercy. And we are to show mercy and grace to the people around us. We are to, to, to not give people what they deserve. People all the time will fail you. People will all the time will make mistakes. People around you will sin and they deserve, they deserve death. They deserve death. But, but have mercy on them. Let the mercy of Jesus Christ reign in your life. And, and, then, and then beyond mercy, give them grace. Give them what they don't deserve. That's what, Paul, that's what the Bible says when you begin to heap coals of fire. On people's heads, you're you're giving them what they don't deserve. All opens up with grace, grace to you. If if you give people grace, if whether in the marriage or in a friendship or in the church, if you will show grace to them, grace. It always requires repentance. In fact, repentance is a grace, I believe. But uh, if you will show grace to them, you know what happens? Peace will come into your life. And that's what Paul says here in this verse. He says, he says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. People are looking for peace. And I... Peace will come when you, when you begin to forgive, when you begin to, to, to love your uh, others as, as Christ loved you, when you begin to lay down your life. Uh, uh, in, uh, I know in a marriage, we, we have this tendency to, to say, well, a marriage is 50-50. You know, a, marriage is, uh, a wife does 50% and a husband does 50%. And there's a problem with that because people cheat. They only do 48%. And the wife, if the wife only does 48% and the husband doesn't does only 48%, you've got a you've got a 4% wall. You've got a wall between you. Uh, already. And, and, and I, I tell people when, when you get married, it's a hundred hundred. You have to you have to be willing to give a hundred percent. You have to be willing to give a hundred percent. Pastor, you don't understand my husband. 100%. Pastor, you don't understand my wife. 100%. <laughs> and when you, when you can't give 100%, you both need to get down on your knees and begin to pray. Say, God, help us. Forgive us for, for wanting our... Wanting an extra 2% from our husband or an two, extra 2% 2 from our wife. It's amazing what will happen. As you begin to show grace to your wife, grace to your husband, grace to your children, grace to your neighbors, grace to your enemies. Peace will begin come into your spirit man. When you repent of your sin, Paul says in Romans 8, 1, Jesus will extend to you grace. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You do not walk according to the flesh. That means I'll do 48%. I'll get away with it. No, you repent. You walk according to the Spirit. There is now no condemnation to salvation. You end up with a relationship of peace. Isn't that what you want in your marriage? Isn't that what you want in your, your family? Isn't that what you want in your church? You want peace in your church. You want peace in your family. You want your, your children to grow up in an atmosphere of peace. And it comes when you walk in, in a repentant Repentance and forgiveness relationship. In verse 3, Paul uh, shows this gospel-based fellowship leads to good memories. He, he says, I thank 
my God up on every remembrance of you. I thank God for every memory that I have of you. Now, this is the same people that beat him and threw him in jail and put him in stocks and bonds. And, and yet, here he's saying, I thank God for every memory of you. Why? Because when you repent and you forgive, when you repent and you forgive, then you, you don't remember those, 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 those things. They're, they're under the blood. You let them go. You let, you let them... And, and, you, and you begin to create new memories. And, and, and that's what happens in a marriage, if you will. If you'll forgive one another, you begin to create new memories. And, and, and life begins to be peaceful. And you begin to know that God has tremendous things in your life. And, and verse 4 says... If, if, you, if you walk in this attitude of forgetting those, those, those sins that people have committed and, and forgiving them, then, then verse 4 says, then you end up not only with peace, but with joy. I, I have, when I pray for you, I have joy because I know God is working in your life. When I pray for you, I have joy because God wants to do great things and, and I'm believing God for it. I, don't get me wrong. I know, I know that there's a time, Ecclesiastes, time to weep. I know there's a time to mourn. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse four. It's okay to weep. It's okay to mourn. It's okay. There, there's a time of grieving. We just we just heard this morning that one of her sisters has lost her husband, and we prayed for her. Immediately, why? Because I know that there, there's that, that loss. There is a time to, to weep. There is a time to mourn. But you don't have to fake it. You know, you know oh, everything's hunky dory. It's okay. It's okay to weep. Life includes sorrow and pain and poverty and death. And, but life also includes the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It includes telling people about Jesus. And, and in, in the midst of, of somebody's grieving, you can, you can pray the, for the joy of Jesus. You can pray for the, the anointing of Jesus to be on their life so that, that healing will come and, and they will be, that they will begin to receive the power and the anointing of God in life to, 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 to continue on and know that God has a plan and God has a purpose. My wife and I were discussing the, the, the fact about this man. He, he, he sent his wife and, and children on ahead of him and, and he was going to join them later and they were on a boat and, and, and they died. They, this boat sank and it died. And he wrote a song. He wrote a song and it says, It is well with my soul. Do you understand the difference here? Sure, he was mourning. Sure, he was hurting. But he, but he understood the good news of Jesus Christ. He realized that he would one day, one day see his family again. And not only that, but God used that very thing that the enemy tried to, to destroy him with. He used it to bless you and to bless me. Is there anybody that has not heard the song in his well with my soul? Anybody? It's a tremendous song. People, you, sure, you can say I'm hurting, but the gospel is coming for it. I'm, I'm, I'm hurting. <laughs> People are receiving hope and, 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 and new life. I'm hurting, but my joy is the forward progress of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything, everything in your life, everything that happens to you, every hurt, every pain, every good thing is an opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be forwarded in your life. Verse 6, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of, of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
It is so good to know that, that God will not give up on you. If you make mistakes, repent. God's not about to give up on you. God sent Jesus because he knew he was going to make mistakes. Jesus died on the cross. He, he took your sins and my sins. And, and they, he knew, they knew that we would make mistakes, but they knew that God would, that, 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 that if we repent of our sin, that God would begin to work in our life and that God will complete the work. If God has started in your life, let Him finish it. Let Him finish the work. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, don't give up. Understand that God has a plan for your life. He who began a good work in you will complete it. Ask Him to do in others what He's done in your heart. I'm going to have to quit here pretty quick. Let me read you. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of faith. Before the joy that was set before him. Look at this. He endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. Sure, there's going to be things that happen in your life that, that are going to want, to want to make you throw up your hands and say, like Elijah, Lord, kill me. But you need, to, you need to understand that Jesus has gone before. And he, he's also endured the cross for us. There's nothing, there's nothing anybody can do to you that they have already done to Jesus. <coughs> the, 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 the shame of the cross. He just despised it. He says, I'll do it. I'll do it. Why? Because he knew that he wanted to be an example to you and to me. And because he knew that there would be a great cloud of witnesses. They will look down upon us. I, I...